Bernstein is a writer and journalist based in Toronto. Her second book, On Opium, Pain, Pleasure, and Matters of Substance, was just published by Goose Lane Editions in September of this year. I speak with her about her push within that work to question narratives around whose lives are enabled or destroyed by opioids, and how, for her, drug use became a tool for writing, and one that forced her to, as she says, look outside herself and engage with the overlapping issues that constitute the overdose crisis. She explains that, you know, drugs from her perspective are the um, kind of microcosm of larger issues with oppression. Perhaps most inspiringly, she argues that at a certain point it becomes necessary to stop worrying about making a convincing case, uh, to have one's cause recognized, and just begin acting to insist upon that cause. She, she talks about the role of direct action, for example, in producing supervised injection sites in Canada and the drug user liberation front's rallying cry, death is not our destiny, which she says is a, a perfect and beautiful slogan that acts as a kind of anti-toxin against the rhetorical power of this downward spiral trope within mainstream discourses on drug use. She says, you know, framing the issue through the downward spiral metaphor fails to generate the required urgency and it also reinforces criminalization and an entrenched fatalism when it comes to the use of opioids. She, she says, fundamentally, dismantling prohibition, um, getting rid of the violence of the drug trade and the dangerous ways that people obtain drugs and, and the dangers that are inherent in illicit drugs. If we want to reduce harm, she says, and even see overall drug use lowered, we must dismantle prohibition. You know, we need to move past policies that, she says, do not prevent death or enable life. There is a way in which all of these institutions, the medical institution, carceral institutions, are infused with a certain moralism around the use of drugs that needs itself to be interrogated. Um, I wanted to start actually by referencing your Twitter takeover. Um, you're, you recently took over uh, the Walrus's Twitter. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you published an adapted uh, portion of On Opium in the Walrus. And one of the tweets was, you know, it stood out for me. You, you ask, how dare I risk romanticizing opioids, which have killed 21,000 Canadians since uh, 2016? Um, and then you say the romantics, many of whom used opioids, were interested in the highs and lows of human experience. And you're sort of insisting that we be both moved by suffering while also seeking joy. Um, that seems to me to capture like the specific dialectical aspirations, at least of on opium and what I think it accomplishes, which is to, you know, talk very honestly about pain, pain management, um, and what makes it, uh, what makes pain endurable. Um, and, you know, like on that point, I guess, like in terms of your own engagement with it, I wonder if you could speak to like the limits and possibilities of metaphor. Like there are these moments in the book where you're talking about this um, early on, you talk about the limits of the pain scale, this one to 10 scale and how frustrating that is and how maybe, you know, metaphors might be more uh, useful and communicative. But then like later in the book, you talk about sort of the limits of empathy and metaphor. And I wonder, like, from your perspective, are these limits connected? The limits between like empathy, like empathizing with those that suffer chronic pain and the limits of basically language and metaphor, you know, like in what ways do you think the constraints enforced by language limit the capacity to feel for the other, you know? Hmm. Um, okay. Uh I think that at the point where I start getting into the limits of it is where I start talking about rights and where um, there's so much of the experience of pain um, or of oppression, like living that from the inside, uh, where you want to feel that the other person recognizes you as human and recognizes you as, as able to feel the same pain and reason in the same way as you do. Um, and there's an idea that you're, by ensuring that the other person really gets you, that you're going to have your human rights of various kinds respected. 
And I guess that the point where I am start, start talking about the limits of metaphor as opposed to the strengths of it is when I move from talking about my own subjective experience and pain treatment uh, with opioids to talking about uh, rights uh, for people who use drugs. And people who, who are in pain are, are part of that, but I'm looking at the broader um, systems of prohibition and capitalism and the multiple oppressions that, that many people live under. And to, and the idea that at a certain point, it doesn't matter how much, what a, what a, what a moving case you make. At a certain point, um, there's a necessity to actually, it's more about power and there's a necessity of looking at, um, how you're going to acquire basic human rights. And at that point, metaphor kind of falls off because there's a fundamental limit to our ability to live within someone else's experience. And so at that point is when you, you have to insist on shared humanity, but spend a little less time trying to convince the other people of it and go ahead and act. And that's when I start talking about drug user movements and, uh, and more activism on where people, uh, take their rights rather than begging for them. And constantly trying to prove a, a moving case. And you know, I think you you speak really uh, engagingly about those social movements. And I want to come back to like the connections you make between AIDS activism in particular mm-hmm. and um, you know drug user unions. But like specifically, I guess I wanted to pick up on this idea that you're you're sort of moving in the book from your own subjective experience into. Uh, like a broader discussion of the rights of drug users. And like that reminded me of how like a lot of the beginning of the book is spent talking about how in many ways um, the writing of the book is enabled itself by using drugs. Like you you talk about how, you know, the, the contemplation, uh, dispassionate absorption, I think is the term you use, is like facilitated by you treating your pain. It's, it's the condition of possibility for writing at all. Um, And I wondered if you could speak, I mean, this is maybe a bit of a a general question, but like the relationship for you between opioids and identity, like you call Mm -hmm. tramadol a quote, robust, adequate container um, and, and explain how like, at the same time, as you sort of want to convey this experience of, of being open up to the world through this drug, you also admit that you don't want to just purely tell the story of pain and addiction, right? There's a lot in there. I'm not quite sure which which part to start with. Um, mm-hmm. In the, the first part of the book sort of chronicles my gradual mental breakdown as a result of untreated pain in a period when I was, didn't have adequate um, treatment of the underlying causes of the pain, the inflammatory arthritis that I have. Um, so during that time, um, things became truly impossible and it's really all of the techniques that I learned mindfulness and cognitive behavioral therapy and all sorts of things that that allow you to get a little bit of distance from pain so that you can remember the rest of your life and and focus on other things without this constant distraction of pain um they, they were in, inadequate and so things um kind of contracted to the point of where everything was about pain. So if I wanted to write, that was my subject. There wasn't really anything else. Um, and I very much wanted to write the only, the only thing I could, the only way forward I could see. And if I was living in this was through finding what's important to me, mm-hmm. uh, what's meaningful. And for me, that's writing. Um, definitely it's all, it would, the pain relief that I had through the, through this opioid drug, tramadol, provides periods of relief. And that's when the writing really happened for the most part. Um, so yeah, it becomes, it became a tool allowing, um, allowing for work to actually happen and thinking to actually happen. But it also, through the process of that, it re- connected me to all sorts of other issues that I discussed in the, the latter two halves of the book, the latter two parts of the book, um, where I start looking with adequately treated pain, it becomes possible to look at a look outside of myself. And uh, what I found is that as I was sort of forced to look into the question of the opioid, uh, the, o- sorry, the overdose crisis um, and, and questions of addiction, which I was sort of just pushed by my editor at first to, to look into, um, I started to realize that, it, that the issues 
that that's many overlapping issues that I've always been interested in when I was started as a freelance journalist 20 years ago and focused on injustice and um, self-directed movements um, to overcome that injustice and poverty and other forms of oppression. But if you look at the lives of people who use illicit drugs, you see a, a microcosm of all of those issues at their most intense. And so it began. I began to try and see the connections, or just began to see, maybe not trying, but automatically began to see the connections between my own experiences as someone in pain, um, relieved by opioids, um, and with life enabled by, by opioids, uh, and the experience of people who seemingly have their lives destroyed by them, um, and started to question that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, there is this like really interesting like structure of self-questioning throughout the entire book i mean at the beginning you you say to the reader it's my story so i get to choose um and i love this kind of uh structure i mean it the, it, the opening chapter for example for me has like a kind of patchwork quality that is like fractured but immersive um it's you know the book as a whole is trying to combine insight and information with almost like rapture and revelation and is reminding us throughout that what it's ultimately arguing uh is that we need especially in this COVID moment to see the emergence of like resilient grassroots care networks that understand how deeply interdependent we are uh, it's just such a beautiful argument and so there's so many touching reminders um of exactly this this need to change the actual like conditions under which people uh, live and thrive. Um, but it's interesting that you talk about how, you know, the, the drug for you open or, or, you know, uh, opioids opened up the possibility of, of this level of engagement because, you know, the reader also encounters all of these attempts to uh, succeed without the use of drugs, like to, to succeed in managing it through like drawing and piano and exercise and all of these things, like yeah. just enduring pain through intervals, like all of that is so palpable in the book. But I think as palpable is this fear that you convey um, of, of like not wanting to raise the effect of dose. Right. Um, you say like, you don't want to fall into this particular trap. And I guess like the question I would ask is like, do you think a person without direct experience of that specific fear, but also what opioids are capable of, you know, could could someone like that without direct access to the experience tell the story that you have? I mean, within the academy and just like in general, there's this increasing idea that like um, rather than theory, we need like auto theory, people who actually can situate themselves, um, you know, and, and their experience in relationship to these larger kind of social issues. And I see your book doing that. Um, you know, what particular issue I suppose do you have with books that are sort of disinterested uh, studies of op opioids use? And, and how do you think, I guess, um, we need to maybe reconsider the uh, attitude we have towards stories that, as you say, sometimes are dismissed as being too subjective because they are actually writing from a place of addiction? Yeah, I think uh, auto narratives, or I don't remember the mm -hmm. phrase is, but the auto theory, auto ethnography, these kinds of yeah, you know, like all of all of those things are are powerful in that if you situate yourself, um, your relationship privilege and things that I emphasize throughout, uh, it feels honest, and you certainly in terms of how particularly how opioids work there's something that is often missed by anyone who hasn't experienced them um, of the particular way dependence works in, with those particular drugs but on the larger issues i think um it is still possible to be deceptive and it's still possible i'm still taking up um mm -hmm. there are many ways in which i can i really do control the narrative and in, in i control how sympathetic i am as a character I control how sympathetic the other people are as a character, whether their full humanity is expressed, whether it isn't what I leave, what I put in, what I leave out. And so any narrative is, is suspect in some sense. Um, I've tried to bring in larger issues that I think are important and mm -hmm. chosen examples from my own experience and then other people's stated experience that support that. Um, I guess you need a diversity of, of narratives. I, um, and definitely, I, I favor when you're talking about groups that experience overlapping oppressions, 
and very little uh, few avenues to to have them addressed. Uh, I think it's very important that that more and more people from those groups are and the most disadvantaged are able um, given su the necessary support and avenues to put their take on it out into the world. Um, but that's not the whole. I mean, it's it's it is very complicated. The question of representation is really complicated, and I don't think there's going to be one solution to it. Yeah, absolutely. And like, it seems like with representation, it's this, you know, it's a kind of chaotic thing where, you know, um, there'll be a, a groundbreaking text, like I think on opium is, um, that will move the discourse forward. But then there's also these scandalous examples of people like James Frey and a million little pieces, you know, he's not helping matters when he falsifies details sensationalistically of like hitting rock bottom during his addiction. Um, although I thought like the public shaming of yeah. Frey was excessive, like when it was revealed that his his story was falsified, it it seemed to like reproduce some of these assumptions about like addict stories being, as you put it, fatally subjective. You know, yeah, uh, the, the particular media narrative that even people who use drugs could fall into, but it's it's a it's a real trope of this spiral mm -hmm. and this downward slide and everything doesn't allow. It's such a you can you can tell it in your sleep it doesn't it, it just rolls off the tongue you don't need to it has no thought and no particularity like it's it's adaptable to any yeah. any story um and it does it misses so much of, of the reality and and doesn't allow the possibility of, of other outcomes and other solutions yeah and and so that's why you know you argue really convincingly that you need to include users in the discourse right yeah, I mean, I think ultimately I, someone like me should step away and other people should be telling, telling the stories. Mm. Um, yeah, sorry, go on. I... No, and, and this is certainly another thing I wanted to take up is, is you know, your book's, um, you know, uh, appreciation of intersectionality, developing an inter intersectional frame for thinking about the effects of and conditions for drug use. Um, you know, you talk about intersecting sources of oppression that increase the, the bearer's exposure to risks. Mm -hmm. um, but you're also, you know, uh, um, trying to, you know, s seek a sympathetic solution, right? You talk about how, like, people seek out the drugs that help them feel okay, mm -hmm. and that we can, you know, apply that to uh, uh, a supposedly post-colonial but truly neo-colonial situation in which, you know, a First Nations opioids epidemic is about, as you put it, like chem chemically inducing tolerance of the intolerable. I've said that people have suggested that. I didn't argue that that's necessarily what's happening. Right, right, right. You're kind of invoking that. But like, there's this idea that um, rather than castigating uh, those that would use drugs to treat trauma, um, we should recognize it as like a creative response to trauma and a tool of like persistence, basically. Um, I really appreciated that you're also saying like, these are not uh, injustices that occurred in the past. You say like, these are harms that result directly today from injustice. And certainly like, this is a moment now in Canada where we're having uh, a, a, a moment of a kind of reckoning around these, these questions. Yeah, right? I wouldn't quite call it a reckoning. Yet. Not yet. No, but some, some conversation about it, some awareness among other people who previously weren't aware of it. Maybe hmm. we're not there yet. We, you're right. We have to be careful for sure about using a term like reckoning. Um, yeah, uh, that, that's something that would represent like a, an actual like structural shift. Um, there are many ways, as, as you say in the book, that people are still trapped. Um, and it's, it's important to, you know, not jump ahead as we so often do, uh, jump over the difficult work of actually engaging with like what it would mean uh, to decolonize something like uh, uh, the system for palliative drug use, for example, right? Like what that, what the actual implications of something like that would be. Um, and, and you, you know, you, in the book, the book is like brimming with ideas. Um, and you know, it's, it's clear, um, you know, in many ways that you, you, you kind of, um, like, I, I see you playing with different ways of ending the book <laughs> at the, at the closing of it. And it, it and I think because you're constantly having to like document what's her occurring now. Um, and you're, you know, you're trying to also, as you say, like seize the means of production of knowledge around this. So there's an attempt to sort of, you know, pack as much into this book as possible. Um, and so I think like there's all kinds of stuff too that, that you drop in, but doesn't get like fully explored. 
um, one of the things that co comes up a few times um, that, you know, I sense you're not expanding on too much because it's, it's very personal is this sense that, you know, drugs allow you also to, to be a good mother, to satisfy these sorts of like normative ideas around motherhood. Mm -hmm. And you, you talk also about how like motherhood, it conflicts with the, the specter of the junkie, right? Um, and, and so like there, there are all of these, these things in the text um, that are both personal and structural, and you're, you're clearly attempting to link the personal and the political. I wonder if you could speak to, you know, the, the feelings that you had around inclu including these you know, like very personal reflections on what it means to be both a mother and a user of opioids. Um, I mean, I'm not conflicted about it at all, um, right, right, right. but it is personal. And it's very, when I mm. did the, the first part of the book was previously published. And um, uh, so when, when I launched that and I had to stand in front of a room of my childhood neighbor and uh, mm. former teachers, former, former employers and, and say, I'm taking, you know, I take every day, I take small amounts of a drug similar to heroin. Um, that was very difficult to say. Um, yeah. and, but I don't think I'm conflicted in my personal experience of, I'm a good parent. I'm a less good parent when I'm depressed or incapacitated or in constant pain. I missed out on so much of my children's childhood, um, because it was in this blur of pain. Um, and I'm angry about that as well. Uh, so I don't, I'm not personally conflicted about the issue, but in, um, I'm in a very privileged position where, uh, currently my, the pain that I, that is unavoidable in my life is, is relatively well treated and I'm able to carry on with my life just to a reasonable extent. Um, other people, whether they're using illicit drugs or not, and who are parents, um, have a very, very different experience. Um, and in the movements of, of some of the, of, um, dependent opioid and multi-drug users in, in Canada, for example, many of the, the people who've done the most, um, the most interesting, um, activism have been our mothers, working mothers. Hmm. And it's inc at incredibly, incredible personal risk, uh, but with a really, really smart analysis of their, of the situation and, and, um, of the ways in which the current dependence that they're in, that they in, is something that needs to be resolved. It can be resolved in different ways. Right. Um, it's so much to pick up on uh, there, but I, I guess I wanted to, uh, you know, ask you to kind of expand on what I see is like the book's philosophy of like pain and the body. You know, there's this kind of um, very blunt statement that it is better to feel good than to feel bad. Um, that our purpose cannot just be to suffer. Um, but you kind of historicize uh, this conception of, of pain in the body by saying that like, um, you know, pain management, uh, palliative care is a post-romantic notion tied up with faith in like quality of life. And today, like the book is suggesting that today that really chafes against a neoliberal politics of like disposability and, and replaceability and so on, where, you know, like the, the example that really stood out for me was um, the, you talk about the use of, is it naltrexone in prisons? Yeah. Well, in, in general, it's a very, it's a popular treatment for opioid addiction. It's also, it's a, it's an effective treatment for alcohol use disorder, but mm. uh, for opioid use disorder, it's very, it's problematic because it forces abstinence mm -hmm. um, in situations where people are, you, where you know, like 1000%, you know that people are going to go out and see, seek a source of opioids. Mm -hmm. And so you've, by once the way, the way dependence on opioids works is that your, uh, what you can safely take is dependent on your level of tolerance. So if someone is guaranteed going to walk out and coming straight out of prison with nothing, mm -hmm. um, out of a traumatic experience, absolutely nothing, no social support, no economic support, nothing. And they're, the first thing they're going to do is go and, and seek out, um, heroin or illicit fentanyl or, or anything. And if their tolerance has been forced down, 
they can no longer take the dose that they were accustomed to and that was previously safe for them. Mm -hmm. And so overdose becomes so much more likely. And it's, you know, the numbers show that very much that you're setting people up for, for overdose. Um, and that's, that's even without considering a market where, an illicit market that where prohibition policies have forced ever more potent drugs and more unreliable drugs. So you don't even, even for regular users who have a very good sense of their, their effective dose and their tolerable dose. Um, they, you can't, you actually don't simply have the information, they simply don't have the information that they need to, to make that assessment. Yeah. And, and the data shows this, this is what the book also like is so adamant about is that, you know, like there are seemingly because of the polarized and deeply moralistic nature of like the discourse around drugs, it's, it's sometimes controversial to just cite facts, to just cite the data. And you, you talk about how like, your issues with basically like knowledge translation, the translation of this data to the public that it's rarely impartially translated. Um, it's, it's usually not contextualized using this kind of information. So like that to me is why the book is so invaluable. Um, and there's this like implication there in that particular case of naltrexone that like we're choosing drugs that deny people like freedom, happiness, pleasure, that it has, as you put it, a distinctly punitive effect. And that like you say, most innovation, quote unquote innovation to make these drugs less addictive, actually focus on making them more painful, yeah. which like, it, it just seems to me that um, the the implication, and I don't know if this is like a stretch, is that there's like, like a carceral logic that's extending out from like the prison into like the medical establishment. And it's all about, you seem to suggest like a real commitment to control and a certain sort of like Puritan attitude toward like pleasure that's governing it. Yeah. I mean, I think some of it's sort of self-justifying. We live in a society where it goes far beyond mm -hmm. just the medical system or just the carceral system. It's all of society. So we have a, a situation where you have an, an illicit market that is in, that has tremendous value and is incentivized to uh, to more ruthless business practices than we see in, for example, with, um, with the Sacklers and, and pharmaceutical opioids. Mm -hmm. Um, but, a, but a far, a, a far more intense version of that. So you have Mexico's this one huge graveyard at this point as a result. Mm -hmm. If you real honestly wanted to, uh, to get rid of, of that violence and the suffering of people who are dependent on something when they don't need to be dependent on it or, who are having to to do things they don't want to do for it or, or whose lives are being shredded as a result of dependence on drugs, you would dismantle that system. Yeah. Um, and the small, the, these small um, steps in that direction that, that were taken in, in a few places, Uruguay's one, but, but Portugal's the example we talk about a lot. Mm -hmm. um, they've shown that it isn't, it isn't a, an issue of, um, Pro drugs versus not pro drugs. You can, if you want to see fewer young people starting to use drugs and fewer people going to more dangerous for routes of using, uh, if you want to see overall drug use lowered, you will dismantle prohibition. And, uh, so what we have is instead a system that we're all stuck in where there's many aspects of it that, that come to seem sensible. Um, for example, urine drug tests. People are getting um, pain treatment now in the U.S. and some place in Canada, or just to a large extent in Canada, as well as people who are getting addiction treatment, um, presumably voluntarily, presumably because they want that, uh, are have their instead of being able to say what what they take, um, they have their uh, urine tested regularly in as a condition of receiving treatment. And in the most humiliating ways possible. And when you try to have a conversation about that and the affront to human dignity that that is, hmm. um, I've just been in a conversation on this, so it's, it's top of mind right now. Um, doctors will see that as, well, it's, it's essential for people's health because they could be taking some, some intense thing. They don't even know that they're taking it and, or it interacts with other medications that they're taking. We have to know for their safety. Um, there's many other ways that you can know, preserve their safety. And there's many, and I mean, the most fundamental way, which obviously doctors don't have control over, um, is to dismantle prohibitions and to have a safe 
legal supply of drugs so that if someone does require that or chooses to go for it, they know what's in it. And so it becomes a calculated risk rather than like, like many other medications or like alcohol is. Um, it, it rather than a um, death sentence or a, a Russian roulette. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, I think it's, um, it's really interesting that you're like zeroing in on prohibition in particular as a phenomenon, as sort of a term, um, because I, I think as a term, it does a lot of work to like alert us to the alarming social effects of the so-called war on drugs, like in using a term like prohibition, which has this deep history in, you know, uh, criminalizing the consumption of alcohol, but also, you know, we've just lifted in Canada a 100 year prohibition on cannabis, you know, like it, mm -hmm. it gets us to a place where we are starting to think um, systematically and structurally, but also, you know, questions of, of human dignity, right? As you say, like, of, of how, you know, access um, determines, and you talked about this extensively through the, the book, though, like the class, the class basis of access to um, clean, safe sources of pleasure, you know, like um, freeing that up in part by, I think, um, you know, laying bare the, the means through which like certain people are stigmatized, dehumanized, monsterized, to use the kind of key term in the book you know, does allow us to develop, I think, uh, a, a more robust discourse. And like, that's what you're trying to do. You know, you're in the book, you talk about the the links between chaotic poly substance abuse. I never use never use the term abuse. Otherwise, yes. yeah, no, this is what I found really interesting about like that particular phrase in the book. Um, it stood out as a very, like, um, self consciously self-critical sort of phrase like you wouldn't normally use a word like abuse because it does criminalize uh users who who are seeking it as a solution um but here you're talking about chaotic poly substance abuse like the yeah. the kind of reckless use of any and all drugs as i suppose a means of um self-medicating in in like a, i don't know haphazard and not necessarily healthy way um and and how that is rooted in poverty homelessness um, and there's this like insistence in the book that death after death after death is not, you know, uh, reducible to individual responsibility, but of course it's like a structural issue. And the logic that you use of like describing these fates that determine everyday life, uh, you know, it really, you know, reminded me of other works like Jacques Derrida's Spectres of Marx, you know, Derrida, um, who I think you quote at one point on the Pharmacon in the book, enumerates these plagues. Uh, in Spectres of Marx, these global plagues, and they run alongside the ones you name: capitalism, prohibition, colonialism, white supremacy, and patriarchy. Um, what the most interesting thing for me about this specific section of like trying to provide a sort of political theory uh, of of you know late capitalism is that you you say many people can't name these things, like they are the unmentionable fates. The fact that there's a lot of, um, you know, dismissing of, as you say, left wing political programs as like wild eyed or too radical. But you say, like, it's precisely radical solutions that we need in order to get to the real root of these problems. And I guess I wanted to ask, like, in writing this book, did you think about the risks of naming capitalism as such, like identifying structural factors as key to the production of human misery? Because, like, you know, many people have written about how it is tricky to like stay legitimately public as an author while contesting the system of which we are a part. I tried to make it to pitch the book towards a wide audience mm -hmm. um, and to make it possible for people to follow me along. Um, but it's, you know, if, if you want to win major awards or get made mainstream attention at chapters or something, it's not, going too deep in that is probably not um, the best approach. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there's tons and tons and tons of theory on capitalism and neoliberalism, and it's all out there in books. Yeah. It's, books are not that, in, I mean, there's a limit to the power of books. Right. And uh, it's possible to do a heck of a lot of theorizing without anything actually happening. So no. it's not like I'm taking, I'm not taking the risks of people who write about, you know, journalists in Mexico or on the border who write about um, narco trafficking or drug use. I'm not taking the risks of the people I write about every day. It's it's 
pretty easy for me to say to say those things. And the worst that can happen is a bit of marginalization as a writer. Yeah, that's a fair point, you know, and um, it kind of reminds me, too, of like the way in which, um, you know, a, a, a film like Cartel Land, and maybe this is to the point of pop cultural representations of, um, you know, drug trafficking and, and so on. Um, but a film like Cartel Land, Matthew Heineman's film about the border between Mexico and the United States and the illicit uh, drug trade, it, you know, it specifically focuses on the how the border marks a division in like relationships to violence. In Mexico, your your experience of violence is very direct, whereas in the United States, it's it's perhaps relatively kind of abstract. Um, you know, similarly, like I think. You're, you're not that removed in many ways from, as you were saying, like the, the palpable fear of, you know, effectively managing pain, like you're, you're speaking very closely to that. But as you keep kind of emphasizing, you can't speak uh, uh, for everyone and you can't necessarily, you could, you could only um, situate your own knowledge in relationship to its, your, your limitations. Um, and, and I think like, this is the thing that pop culture um, when it is, you know, uh, um, boundary pushing and experimental can do is collapse the distance between those who are, you know, who, who are disproportionately exposed to violence and those for whom violence is abstract. I mean, you know, and, and this is to the point of like a real issue within Hollywood, basically, of, of, of glamorizing to some extent drug addiction as something that is um, very simplistic. Like I had a friend, for example, who couldn't watch the show lost because of the representation of the Charlie character. Right. And the fact that is when they land on the Island, he's going through, you know, painful withdrawal. She was so, uh, resentful of this over the top performance that she couldn't watch it. Right. So like these pieces of pop culture have a real like a really powerful impact. Um, a good rep a good representation that surprised I me. Mean, I don't, I don't, haven't seen all of the things that you that you mentioned. Um, but a good uh, portrayal of the of drug war politics actually is in Kingsman Two. Mm. Uh, very surprising, very gory. Um, but they actually got uh, a lot of what goes on quite quite effectively. Uh, yeah, I mean, and it, it sometimes you can be surprised, right? Like when when they get it right to some extent. Um, and yet I think like there's a, a degree to which like a, a film like Sicario, um, in it's like gritty, you know, attachment to certain kind of social realism, uh, sort of backfired because famously, apparently Donald Trump, Rachel Maddow pointed out that Donald Trump seemed to be directly influenced by the film Sicario in his, you know, discussion, his public discussion of the, uh, the, the drug war, the drug trade. Um, so I mean like it, you're, yeah, sorry. Maybe I mean in the book I do discuss um, Donald Trump's uh, and and other right wing authoritarian leaders mm -hmm. um, or would be authoritarian leaders um, and their relationship with drugs, which tends to be um, they make use of the tropes that you hear mm -hmm. um, as a way to often to gain political points to advance um, law and order like so called law law and order policies. Uh, or anti-immigration policies, and particularly to perpetrate a war on on the poor, like we see with Duterte. So it's it's a very instrumental. I, I doubt that that it was only one film that or, or one series that uh, that influenced Donald Trump. It's the whole it's plucking uh, the most disadvantaged and thought to be least empowered people uh, and and using them as a, to score political points. And there's a long tradition, um, certainly, of, of, you know, stigmatizing drug users as basically a pretext for these sorts of fascist crackdowns. Um, in fact, in many cases, the war on drugs has been used to, like, just straight up suppress social movements. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think it's, it's powerful, but it's, I think you're, you're right to point out that we shouldn't overstate, like, the impact of one particular film. It's, it's more of, like, this broad, diffuse you know, reinforcing of already existent assumptions around drugs. Like you talked about the media production of fear regarding drugs and especially like the loss of autonomy as a result of drugs. Um, the, the incessant, you know, the recurrence of zombie drugs 
as something that, you know, there's like a million manifestations of what a zombie drug could be. That immediately made me think of the, um, the quote unquote Miami zombie story, um, which had bath salts, you know, as at the kind of core of it. Mm -hmm. But it seemed to me like that story is, is case in point of, of how we don't tend to, or the media doesn't tend to invoke uh, a sense of destruction. I mean, there was no discussion of the fact that this man who c committed a horrific crime at the tail end of this psychotic break, mm -hmm. you know, that that break was produced through economic desperation. I mean, the man's the car breaks down and he just sets off across the city. You know, it wasn't just about bath salts, but we, we animate the drug and dehumanize the user um, from your perspective. Um, and mm -hmm. I, I, I kind of wanted to pick up on that that thing of like animating the drug itself and and the fear of a loss of autonomy in relationship perhaps to this like use of drugs as a pretext for increased policing and so on your your association of the zombie trope which i do discuss um and with loss of autonomy fears is interesting because i'm not sure that i actually made that connection it's actually a really good one um i mean i'm i in the, the first part of the book, I, uh, there's a lot of worrying about addiction, but I'm not actually either addicted or uh, dependent on, on the medication. In By this second and third half, I am. And I am now. I, I hmm. If I wanted to stop taking tramadol, I would need to taper it very carefully, and uh, that might be a really difficult process. Um, I don't meet any criteria for an opioid use disorder, but I, I need the drug or I don't function. I can't function. Um, and I needed a certain dose in a certain time, uh, every single day, several times a day. So I definitely have lost some autonomy. If I get on a plane and I forgot that drug, there is no holiday. It's not going to, it's, right. there's no, nothing's going to happen without that. Everything falls apart. So that is definitely a loss of autonomy. So it's not, dependency is definitely not an ideal situation. It's not what anyone would seek out. I'm sure if, you know, if heroin was available in the pharmacy and you, you decided to, to go get it and you had to have a conversation about do i want to take do i want to take on dependence um i don't even know what, i don't know what cigarettes if that's if that's a something that's ever been tried um mm. instead of just stigmatizing people but it's dependence isn't something you usually take on that you would take on joyfully yeah uh, you take it on because the benefits outweigh the risk the risk. Mm -hmm. So in people who are already dependent on illicit drugs, it's you, you know, you have a whole history that's gotten them there. And the question now is what, what's the best thing to do about it? The same thing with people who are taking a prescription painkillers. And, you know, and so for some people, it's clearly facilitating a full life and it's best not mess with. For other people, they maybe take these prescribed recklessly or without a lot of care, prescribed at too high a dose. And the person's now um, dependent on that. And they actually don't need that much to manage their pain. In some cases, a voluntary taper to a lower dose will actually uh, result in, in better outcomes. Um, but also, uh, there's, it's, start, uh, it's starting to become very clear with um, through, through gradually increasing, accumulating research, um, building on, on anecdotal reports that even if some, it's not the ideal situation, tapering, tapering people. Um, or force forcing people off those medications results in a higher rate of suicide hmm. and results in other harms. So it might be that once you're, it, it is possible in some cases, dependence is just what you're stuck with. And um, it might, for some people, you might be able to get off. For some people, it might not be worth getting off. And for some people, it's actively harmful getting off, no matter, no matter what, no matter how carefully it's done. So it's, it's, I, I treat dependence as a, as a, in the book as something that is, that is ambiguous. Like it's not, it's not what you want, but there's many things in life that they don't want. Right. Um, and so you, it, it needs to be, it would be far better if the question of dependence on a substance was balanced. It was, was treated in a more balanced way where those, those conditions that are surrounding it and the history leading up to it are taken into account and the immediate or like next moment experience of that person is taken into account. Getting someone off the drug um, because it allows them to meet their 12 steps, uh, even though their the rest of their life is a misery, or even though they're now risking death and even they're dead, um, is not and I is not improving their lives. And so it's not the best. Treatment. And recovery where you're dead is not much of a recovery. Well said. And 
in general, I think like this, this argument for a balanced um, perspective, you know, it, it also in the book, uh, um, you know, it, it appears in terms of this, this really dialectical understanding of, of the sorts of like hypocrisies uh, that we that we often reinforce by talking in in really odd terms about like uh, uh, certain drugs that are you know can be used casually and without any stigma and others that are are unspeakable. You you talk about but opioids lack of morality like it is as a substance lacking in any morality and and to me like this this simple but important point reinforces the idea that like the de-prescribing movement, for example, is, um, you know, brutally simplistic, doesn't actually take into consideration the diversity of people's experiences. Um, you know, the, the, the substance in and of itself is not the problem, especially when you consider, as you say, like, if we, if we want to take a balanced comparative kind of um, look at how and why people seek out these things, you know, there, there are other forms of dependence that we don't stigmatize. Like you talk about exercise addiction, which is this pursuit of endorphins, or in, as you say in the book, endogenous morphine, uh, you know, this thing that we see as the most natural, healthy thing to pursue endorphins is just a form of naturally occurring morphine. You know, like prohibition means that we're largely ignorant of, of what's going on. And like for you, fundamentally, it's 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 really about trying to, um, you know, reckon outside of morality with what drugs do, their pot their potential, um, and and also I suppose reckon with what we don't know. Yeah, when we talk about decriminalization, um, there's definitely ways to do it that are that are good and positive, um, and there's ways that are really bad. So, hmm. I, alcohol does a tremendous harm. Um, I wouldn't advocate prohibition for it, but I'd certainly advocate a less commercial, uh, a less commercial approach to it. The same thing with prescription opioids, the, the uh, financial interests made it very hard for them to be, uh, for decisions, for them to be prescribed in a responsible way, for decisions, um, for, for patients or users to, to uh, seek them in a reasonable way, in a thoughtful way. And what we're seeing with cannabis and Canada is the same thing. It's being done badly. Um, and so there's some wonderful things, um, but there's, first of all, there's no, there haven't been, um, like people who have suffered from that drug war are not the ones benefiting now. Um, but also there's now it's, you know, now anything that has some constituent of cannabis in it is, is considered a health food. Um, it's still the same drug it was before. Uh, although the harm, some of the harms of prohibition have been removed, but now we've got mm. the harms of an unfettered, market mm -hmm. uh that's not the best way to do it either yeah and you know you talk about how um online cannabis sales are up 600 percent during the covid pandemic and there's this like really vivid section in the book where you talk about the appearance of pot you know pot shops after lockdown but you know i wanted to move into the book's engagement with the covid moment that we're in um sure. you know you you do note that there's not only been an in a massive increase in cannabis consumption but um, an increase in overdose deaths during the pandemic. Um, I wondered if you could, like, just first of all, describe the the stark situation in Alberta and what happened there with the shutting down of sh safe injection sites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, COVID's. We've seen COVID um, make every, all of the divisions in society and all of the sort of implicit ideas of whose whose life is valuable. Um, whose uh, labor is valuable. That's all become very clear now um, through COVID. And so it's had, it's had similar effects on, uh, on overdose. So in Canada, we're lucky to have supervised injection sites and other forms of harm reduction. Mm -hmm. um, in the absence of a legal regulated market and, and where the illicit trade is, is, falls apart because there, um, because there isn't a profit incentive. Uh, in the absence of that, this is what we have. So people are being essentially kept alive by, by harm reduction measures. As soon as COVID hit and lockdown hit, many of the, um, things like supervised injection sites, uh, drop-ins, um, social places, all of these things shut down. And so 
more people were using at home, using um, on their own without the opportunity to, to be revived in the event of an overdose. People were using in more stressful situations with greater loneliness, greater intensity, all use of all drugs increased. Um, problems in the drug supply have also resulted in increasingly weird adulterants and unexpected um, constituents in, in drugs that people are taking. Um, and because of the general instability, what I try to get at in the book is, is how much, um, if what you're concerned about is, is safety for patients, um, both, both pain, people in pain and, uh, drug users, you, stability would be your first concern. And before you mess with anyone's substances anyone is taking, you would first get them stable in, in their lives. Um, because of the increased instability that we've all experienced during COVID in different ways, either too much work or too little work, uh, too much isolation or being trapped with, with a few people in who you're seeing 24 seven. Um, because of this, people are using in a, in a much more unstable way and they're trying to balance moods and function in ways that soft, often incentivize, um, multi-drug use. So stimulants to get up and get to your, your frontline job, uh, depressants to get you to sleep at night despite stress. Uh, there's been a crisis of eviction, like a massive push of people from uh, just barely getting by to not getting by at all. And uh, family doctors are seeing that in the desperation of their patients. And we're seeing it sort of at, at every level of society, but particularly at this. And so it's, it's not at all surprising that overdoses are, are completely out of control and people are, are dying of it. So since um, publishing this book, one person who I profiled has uh, died of overdose. I discovered that on the day it was published. Um, she was 33. And there's no possible way that that was not the result of, of drug, of poor drug policy. There was no other reason for her to lose her life. Mm -hmm. Um, was someone who wanted to live. And, uh, I, and there's other, many other people who I'm very worried about. So, um, the other thing you asked about was Alberta. So I don't know very, I mean, I, I watch in her from, from Ontario, which is not so fantastic either, but Alberta has a very far right government, um, with a, with a evangelistic or religious orientation to the idea of addiction. So a real fascination for the idea of recovery. Recovery means abstinence. So the idea is getting people, and now they use words like compassionate, but you're getting people off drugs. Um, and the, specific conditions of their lives or and the specific type of dependence they have the specific needs they have and the degree to which they can maintain some degree of stability in their lives is not a, is not a, a factor in that and so um the people behind this in alberta have promoted uh like in the recent elections we saw promoted uh, a certain number of treatment beds and rehab uh, community centers things like that um that are vague terms that that sound good but as, as we discussed earlier, all of the information, all of the data that we have suggests that, that whatever form they take, they're not likely to prevent death in a situation where death is the outcome we really need to be focusing on at the moment. But they're also not likely to be enabling life because they're not, um, harm reduction policies are a, they're like a stopgap in, in a vastly unjust society and then, and then, and a society that, that continues to use prohibition, but in, on a personal level, they involve restoration of dignity and autonomy to people, um, and showing that their lives are valued and, uh, and allowing them to make, to make choices in the safest and best possible way. Um, that's not, and the outcomes that we have of treatment beds in preventing death, uh, like, and in, in hospital treatment for preventing death are very, very, very worrying, very bad. Um, med medication is the way to deal with opioid use disorder. It's the, the best way. And while long-term trauma counseling is probably a really good idea that many people would like if they could afford it, um, it's not simply saying we're going to, we're going to heal people or, you know, restore the value of their lives, not just their actually keeping them alive, as if that's not demonstrating value of their lives. Um, all the data we have shows that actually the kind of treatments um, that Jason Kenney has proposed in Alberta and the uh, are dangerous, like they're actively dangerous. And 
measures that they've done already of closing supervised injection sites or reducing hours of cutting um, programs like the injectable opioid agonist treatment program, they throw people into chaos and make death a likely outcome as well as a poor quality mm. of life. Um, yeah, and and this idea of throwing people into chaos, this is something I think COVID has um, hopefully made visible for, for more people, the idea that things like homelessness um, are, 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 or, you know, an epidemic of overdose deaths, this is a policy decision. Um, you know, this is in fact the outcome of the kind of accretion of neoliberal policies and so on. Like this is something I think you argue very convincingly in the book. Um, and like the other thing I think you, you rightly point out is this issue with, um, pu public apathy on some level, like on, on page 113, you talk about, uh, or you seem to be talking about the issue with just the, the kind of attention economy and, and trying to influence public opinion by crafting messages that do engender the right sort of empathy or outrage. Like this seems to become increasingly difficult, but I think you see a lot of hope in the book in, um, you know, uh, the example of social movements like ACT UP, AIDS activism that try to make visible this unfortunate truth um, that people considered not with, you know, part of the social contract were dying and that those lives mattered. Um, you know, you, I, you know, I think there's, there's an enormous amount that we could still talk about, especially on this point of, of, yeah. yeah. There's, there's an organization called the Drug Users Liberation Fund um, out in BC. They've been, I profiled their very first action in the book, but I wish I could have continued. Um, they've been doing events where they hand out tested, labeled methamphetamine, cocaine, heroin, hmm. um, other, other drugs um, to dependent users. Um, and they have a slogan. So that's the directest of direct action. They say they've done all that can be done in trying to persuade the governments to recognize that they are dying and that their lives matter and that policy changes that experts, including drug users, have called for are, are necessary. They've sort of reached the end of the line on that and are now trying direct action, which is the way supervised injection uh, facilities came um, came to be in the first place. Um, and most other things like compassion clubs for cannabis and um, and uh, group group buying of, of medications for AIDS patients, all were AIDS patients were all uh, like all grassroots and often civil disobedient civil disobedience movements. Um, so they're, they're, they have a motto that they've been putting out um, called death is not our destiny. And to me, that's, is, is, it is just so perfect and, and beautiful. It is an idea that we get into because of this uh, downward spiral narrative that we, we're given about people who use drugs is that if you're poor, if you're homeless, and if you use drugs, those things sort of all bleed together, allowing for you to have policies that target, supposedly target drug users, but actually target urban poor, um, that, that, that their deaths are inevitable. There starts to be this idea that they're just on a path that we're, it's sad, it's too bad, you can either feel compassion for them or you can talk about them as zombies. Um, either way, you're expecting that they're going to die and any attention paid to that is, is an issue maybe of compassion. Um, or an issue of telling people to get themselves in shape. Um, but it's not an issue of urgency. And the way, the fact that we've had dec a decade now of, of the Liberal government uh, soliciting input on what would help deal with the overdose crisis, and every time they're told uh, what would help with that, they say, well, decriminalization is not a silver bullet. Hmm. Um, and they just, they just say that phrase, but it's, the, it's it's meaningless. It's not examined. It's not it's not thoughtful, and it ignores so so much that that could be done that another country might do, um, and and it perpetuates this idea that those lives are sort of you know we can be really sad about them, but we kind of expect this to happen. We expect a young woman of thirty three to to die when um, if she had been able to use in a safe environment and a drug that she knew what she was taking, that she wouldn't have died. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no, and that she could have lived this a full life. Um, we accept that. We sort of have this idea that that's just the way it's supposed to be. That the the life expectancy of 
drug users and the life expectancy of people on the street is meant to be in their 30s and 40s. Um, that's all not true, and death is not their destiny. Um, but the narratives that we hear and that we accept um, that fail to make connections to larger issues and historical issues that, and continuing um, continuing oppressions and continuing structures that contribute to this stuff, um, by, by those narratives that ignore them, we start to have that idea that death, in fact, is their destiny. And so we can take an individual position towards that um, that's positive or negative, but we're not fundamentally going to do anything about it the way you do something when there's a real emergency. If I could just mention quickly, like your book's uh, discussion of the concept of deaths from a despair, um, which yeah. is to me, you know, similar in some ways to this idea, the soundbite of like decriminalization is not a silver bullet, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's like an empty phrase. It's a very liberal idea. Death, deaths from despair. It's similarly like about pitying yeah. those who, as you say in the book, are hustling for heroin as the solution to their problems. Yeah. You know, it, like it really disempowers those who die from despair. So I thought like your issues with that concept were really interesting too. Yeah, it's, I mean, I mean, it's, it's a start, right? It's recognizing that people exist, that these people exist. Yeah. It's recognizing that there is despair. All of that's true. It just stops. Mm -hmm. It stops short of, um, of looking at those people like, this, like um, the poverty tourism that I described where people tour slums and, and look at them and as if they're animals in a zoo um, and and feel bad. So that's the compassionate side of, of this kind of response I've described. Um, but it doesn't go further and it continues to, to persistently avoid looking at the actual structures that result in, in the problems that we see. Um, wow. Yeah. And, you know, while... I totally concede the point that you made earlier that, you know, there are limits to what a book uh, can do. I think this book can do an enormous amount to change people's thinking. Um, you're, you're doing this work of trying to, uh, you know, undermine some of these like operative assumptions, like the downward spiral trope, which is so powerful in our way of thinking about, um, you know, uh, the addict, the specter of the junkie and so on. Do you, Scott? Do you have a chance for me to read you that section about this woman who just died? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, um, please do. Just one second. I'm just going to find it. So I just, so the, this woman who, um, who I wrote about in the book and then found out on the day that my book was published that she had, I found out a few days previously that she had overdosed over the summer and then that she had died uh, um, on September 10th. Uh, my book was published on the 14th. So just this little bit where I wrote about her kind of gets at this. She writes, uh, she, she told me, my life went spiraling out of control and I lost myself, said Snickers, a bright, engaging 33-year-old woman, when I interviewed her as we sat at a pic picnic bench a few meters away from the tent where she lived with her partner on the grounds of a Toronto charity. Now, although Snickers first attributed her eight-year stretch of homelessness to her use of fentanyl, crack, cocaine, crystal meth, and alcohol, she later, later confided that she'd started using drugs to control the emotional pain of abuse she experienced from childhood, abuse that led her to leave her home in Regina, Saskatchewan, and move to Toronto and the streets. Um, decades of research going back to the 1930s likewise show a complicated relationship in which drug use sometimes causes homelessness through non-payment of rent, for example, um, and sometimes uh, results from homelessness. Um, and so th that trope is, is something that people may use to describe themselves because the feeling of thing, the same thing when I was, when I was having that sort of mm -hmm. me uh, mental breakdown from emotional breakdown due to pain, mm -hmm. uh, it feels like a spiral. It's a, it's a good, uh, it's a nice shape. Uh, you picture things just going and you, you, you can no longer stop them. You don't know what, but, but it's not, there was an issue of physical dependence on drugs. And there's also an issue of consequences from using drugs, which are largely related to criminalization and unsafe places and ways of using. So you could remove in a different society and in certain societies now, you can, you could remove those uh, consequences and then you'd be left with a dependence, uh, like mine, which you could choose whether to treat, uh, by, by gradually moving towards, uh, different use or less use or no use. Um, or you could decide, well, you know, this is the best we're going to get. We're going to stick with dependence and we're going to get the rest of our life the way it, we're, we're going to live in a house and we're going to have a job or we're going to have friends. And not, there isn't one of those things that's necessary, but, but having a full life means no longer 
having to spend your entire life um, trying to deal with the, with the consequences of drug use, many of which are, are socially, socially imposed, socially constructed. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, there's also an enormous amount in the book around um, your realization of disability and your connection to disability studies and this, you know, investment in the social model of disability, the idea that like society has disabling effects and that classification mechanisms can sort you and suppress you. I mean, um, there's, yeah, there's so much we could, you know, still talk about, but um, I won't keep you any longer. Uh, I, I, you know, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you finding the time, but also just finding the energy to put this book together. Thanks so much.